believe we are on. Good morning. Oh, good morning. All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our 9.30 Adult Education Hour. We're glad you're with us online or on Sundial. If you are on, as we have been doing lately, we encourage you to get on Facebook and participate in the comment section. We have some uh, texts that we are going to be pasting in the comments so that you can read them there. And we also, as always, welcome your thoughts and your feedback and your questions. So we do want to give you the opportunity to be part of this conversation uh, in the Facebook comment section. So my name is Stephanie Borger. I'm currently serving on session and chairing the Adult Christian Education Committee. Pastor Allison will be here momentarily, and she will be leading our conversation this morning. And we also have with us this morning, Eric Chase. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for being, thanks for letting me be here, Steph. Thanks for being Glad here. Glad to be Eric. here. Glad to be here. So we are in the middle of a series that our pastors are leading, exploring great prayers of Christian history. We looked at a prayer by Martin Luther two weeks ago. Last week we looked at uh, the often called prayer of St. Francis, although we don't know the actual author. And today, Pastor Allison will be leading us in a conversation about some more famous prayers and how they might help uh, nourish our, our life of faith. But before we get into that, we do want to let you know of some other opportunities to engage in uh, education and faith formation here at FPC. Every Sunday night, we have Zoom evening prayer at 7 p.m. And you can log on either with your computer or by calling in on the telephone. And we pray together every Sunday night using some psalms and spending some time meditating on scripture and sharing our own prayer requests and praying for, for the needs of the world and the needs of our community. So you are always welcome to join us every Sunday night at 7 on Zoom. We also have some Bible study groups meeting throughout the week. On Tuesday mornings, the Moms Bible Study is meeting. On Wednesday nights, we have a Wednesday night Zoom Bible study meeting. Uh, that group is currently reading the book of Mark, and you are always welcome to pop in on Zoom as well. And you can see the announcements in your online bulletin for all of the different opportunities that are happening here. All right, so we are waiting for Allison uh, to come and, and lead us. But if you are on Facebook in the comments, go ahead and say hello. And tell us if there is a prayer that you know that is especially meaningful to you. We'd love to see those in the comments section. What, what, are, what are famous prayers that are especially meaningful to you? Yeah, that's a great idea. Tell us what prayers you like. Um, there are some particular prayers that have spoken to you over the course of your life. Some that have been extremely meaningful. We'd love to hear about them. So, well, good morning, everybody. I'm sorry I was just reheating, reheating my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even able to drink any of it before um, this morning. It just seemed like a quick morning. Everything was, just was yeah. happening very quickly today. So I hope you guys are at home. You're safe. I'm hoping that in an hour or so when I leave to go home, it won't be too bad. But I do know that it's coming down out there. So hopefully it will be okay. But I'm going to give our panel participants some oh, good. prayers here. So you have them Awesome. In front Thank of you, you so much. I had them on my phone, but it was like yeah, I know. it was kind of like small. So. Kind of small on your phone. Yeah. All right. Well, let's. Why don't we start with a word of prayer? Let's. let's That'd pray. be great. Gracious God, we're so thankful for Sunday mornings. We're thankful, Lord, when we can gather around Your Word and at Your table and um, with each other, um, near and far, to to just dive deeper into Your Word and to dive deeper into Your promises and to praise you and worship you. Lord, we're grateful for um, wonderful prayers that have been written over the centuries and, over, and how people have really just poured out their emotions and poured out their faith through these prayers. And we think, God, we, it's a good learning exercise to look at these wonderful prayers that have been written down and maintained and kept for for a long time, and uh, we just pray, Lord, that as we read these, that we are ourselves convicted of your promises and your grace, 
and that we are reminded that uh, when we pray, we are not alone in pouring out our heart and our soul to you, and that you listen to these prayers and answer them according to your perfect will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, our first prayer is for any, anybody chime in yet on Facebook stuff? Just kind of wondering if there's any initial comments. Not yet. None yet. Okay. All right. Taking Are y'all awake out there? Taking a little time to wake up this morning. That's okay because that's what I did. So, it's all right. yeah. um, so we're going to look at a couple different prayers today. And we might not have time to look at all the prayers, or we might. I don't. I just don't know how fast we'll go through these. But um, the first prayer that I really wanted to start out with this morning is a prayer by Thomas Merton. Um, and this is a really wonderful, heartfelt, easily accessible prayer. Um, and so I thought we would just go ahead and read it. I think that Steph may be able to put it into the comments. It is in the comments. You okay. can read it on Facebook. All right, so you can look at the prayer in the comments on Facebook. And I'm going to go ahead and read this prayer. And <clears throat> I'm going to just, I'm going to say this prayer just slowly so that we can just take in the simplicity of the prayer, the beauty of the prayer, the honesty of the prayer. Um, and so we're just going to take this in and then we'll talk a little bit about it, okay? So again, this is a prayer by Thomas Merton. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I think I really know myself. And the fact that I think think I'm following your will does not mean I'm actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear. For you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. So that is, that is the prayer. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's really simple, really heartfelt, honest, and such a beautiful prayer of trust. Um, if you had to... Um, capture this prayer in a couple of words. What would you say this prayer is really about to you? What is this prayer really about for you as you, as you read it? Well, I think for me, Allison, like when I first read this when you sent it to me earlier this week, I thought to myself, this is about my life. This is about mm -hmm. life in general. You know, like I, I think right. about, you know, here I am at the end of seminary and when I first entered that journey, like I just trust it. You don't know. And like you're at the end of something now and you're kind of like, when you get to the end of something, you're kind of like, oh, that's what that was. But sometimes you got to just trust in the journey. And I, and I think about that all the time. And like, yes, that's yeah. really what this is saying. And I mean, yeah. it's really a prayer for our time now, right? I mean, Absolutely. we still, you know, we've come through 2020. We're in 2021. Woo, -woo right? We're <laughs> heading into February. But like, do we still know? You know, there's still this unknown. And I, I think for me, the whole thing of, trusting and doing what God desires, but not sure if that's even the right thing, you yeah. know, but trusting that as long as I'm doing it because it pleases you, then yeah. it could, hopefully it is pleasing, right? Like there's just so right. much doubt and, and unknown in this that I think, it, exactly. I just think it's a prayer for life. It's a prayer for now. It it's is. a prayer for a time when we're doubting in our yeah. life, you know, yeah. so really kind of just puts that, that faith and that strength in, 
I don't know God, I don't know what's <laughs> happening, but I trust you, and if that's good enough for you, that's good enough for me, right? Yeah, so, yeah. and how many, remind me how many years ago you entered seminary, Eric? Uh, chronologically, it was six, but it took me five to complete, so. <laughs> And you have seven, so, so I'm still doing good. <laughs> so I've, I've been actually studying five years actively, but I, I entered at age 49, and I'm 65 now. So. Wow, wow. So, yeah. And so you initially had this call to go into seminary, kind of not even knowing where you would end up. Right. And here you are, and there's still some uncertainty to that. Right. And so you can pray this prayer really yeah. honestly, can't mm -hmm. you? Yeah, absolutely. And, and have real conviction and, and, and feel a connection and a meeting in it. Right, You know, exactly. it's not just those words. And again, you know, I think where I'm sure you talked about this earlier in your conversations, but it's just a conversation with God. Yeah. So this is so conversational, it right? It is. It's just it like, is. and that's what I think prayer is. Prayer is just a conversation with God. Yeah. Yeah. Whether he speaks back or not. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? Exactly. I love that. Thank you, Eric. Good. Yeah. Well, we have some folks on Facebook waking up. Okay. Okay. Great. Anne says it's powerful and so meaningful. Oh, yes. And that she thinks she's felt all of these things at one time or another. Yes. Yeah. So. Yes. And Pat says it's about trying to do the right thing, yeah. but not sure of the path of God, but trusting that God will guide us. Absolutely, absolutely. That is so. It's that's so true. Both both those statements are, are very true. Um, it's it's about not knowing what's next. And boy, I mean, I feel like that is a universal theme, right? Mm -hmm. That is universal. That every one of us has at one time been in a place where we're like, what's next? You know. And I think probably um, the disciples, Jesus' disciples, after Jesus ascended, probably could have prayed this prayer. <laughs> like, okay, now that's like, now what do we do? Where do we go? We no longer have Jesus to guide us. We're all alone. We can't see the road ahead, but we're going to trust that our desire to please God Please, it does please God. Right. I love that line. Yeah, that line really stuck out to me too. Yeah. 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 And I think I see a real humility there. Yeah. And a yeah. real, like, healthy God centeredness. I know, you know, in my own life, in times when I feel this sort of uncertainty about what I'm supposed to be doing, or do I even have faith, or am I even you know, pleasing God at all, it's yeah. really easy to become sort of inward focused mm. and really focused on like, oh, well, my faith isn't good enough. Yeah. My obedience isn't good enough. Right. I'm not faithful enough. Right. And that might sort of feel like humility, but it yeah. actually ends up being the opposite because you're putting yourself and your focus on, you know, your own qualifications yeah. really at the front of your mind. Right. Whereas this kind of reverses it and says, you know, I'm trusting in God. I'm trusting that God is pleased yeah. by even my, you know, wanting to please God. Right. And I'm, I'm, yeah, like leaning into that, that trust, that, that confidence and that focus on, on God's will yeah. and not being so worried about myself. Yeah. And I think having that desire, I think the next part that talks about it, and having that desire in all you're doing. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, so often I think that, and, and I'll speak for myself, there were times in my life where I only, I turned my faith on, on Sunday, you know, and I got yeah. into that faith mode, yeah. but then you get into your job and you're like, am I still in that faith mode? Am I still working towards the desire of what God, you know, and, and when you talk about, you know, you talk about call and all of that, like, are you truly in your work called to your work as a desire mm -hmm. to please God, you know, or in your home life or whatever, yeah. you know? So I think that like in all you're doing and, and that's just, you yeah. know, well, what a, what a, what a, heavy, I guess, heavy prayer to pray, you know, like yeah. that put this, put this desire in everything I'm doing. Think mm -hmm. about that. Yes, and that everything is, you're doing. That's heavy. And that is like so true though, because like we compartmentalize our lives often. So like our faith life can be sometimes totally separate from like our family life, our work life and everything. And like, it's like, you do one thing on Sunday and then you do something on Monday that doesn't seem consistent with your Sunday self. <laughs> do you ever feel that way? Because I totally feel that way sometimes. I'm like, 
oh man, I'm making decisions on Wednesday that I never would have made, you know, on Sunday in my Sunday self. So we do get really trapped, I think, into that, like, you know, Sunday, I'm good, I'm grounded in the word, I'm going to church in the morning, I'm so good, I've got God focused. And then by Wednesday, it's like, I'm self-focused, you know, I'm, I'm interested in, in my own will and my, you know, and my desire for, you know, where I want to go next or what I want, what I want to do next or whatever. But to be able to pray this prayer every single day, yeah. I think is just, it's tough, but I think it's, it's important. I really do. I, you know, go ahead. Yeah. Gail on Facebook says perfect prayer. So yeah. <laughs> this is resonating with people. Yeah, yeah. This is, I do feel that same way, Gail. This does seem like just the perfect, the perfect prayer because it almost speaks to us wherever we are. You know right. what I mean? Like you can always, you know, it just, it just resonates. You know, it's just, it's right there. I'm, I'm wondering about um, how do we know and can we know if we're following the will of God. According to this prayer and Thomas Merton, it seems like we don't always know. We don't always know that we are definitely following the will of God. But the, the thing that we want to focus is on focus on is that we're trying. <laughs> right? We're trying, which is different than we are, but we're trying. We have the desire to follow God, to be a disciple. But, you know, that's, that's not always what we're, what we're doing. Yeah. You know what I mean? And many of the early theologians would say that. You know, that we yeah. have the, as long as we're doing the desire, right. we may not get there. Because how do we know? You know, I mean, you know, yeah. some of us get, like, I get chills when I, when I say something. I'm like, oh, that might, you know. Or for me, it's like, if I hear somebody, like, it's kind of funny, like, if, I hear something and then I read it and then I'm doing my Bible study and it comes up in the Bible study. I'm like, all right, God, I get it. Are you trying yeah. to tell me something here? Yeah. You know, but like, do we really know? You know, like, yeah. and so often we don't, we don't know. So yeah. it's, I think it's in, it's in that, not so much our effort, but just in our desire to please God yeah. and to do the things that would be pleasing to God. Yeah. And hope that what we're doing is pleasing to God, right? Like, yeah, exactly. Wow, that's very unknown, isn't that? Very, that was, that's very, uh, very. I'm very being very affirmative here in all of this, right? Not really, but so just that kind of thing, you know. And just yeah. that's faith, right? I guess that's the definition of faith. Yeah, yeah, and I really appreciate. There seems to be a really healthy dose of sin in this prayer yeah. because yeah. it yeah. kind of acknowledges like we don't always get it right, and we're not always following the will of God, and that's. That's almost to be expected, you know, because we're human. Like, we sin, we're broken, and we are self-focused, you know? And not only are we not always following the will of God, I, I think we all sort of know that, yeah. but that sometimes yeah. we're not following the will of God even when we sincerely think that we are. Uh, yeah. This yeah. line really struck me. The fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And that's sort of often easy for us to identify in retrospect. Like we yeah. think of, you know, Christians maybe in years prior doing things that we now recognize like, wow, that was really misguided. Yeah. But it's often so much harder to recognize in the moment. It's, it so is. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, like where he says, that, you know, I believe it's through God's grace that as he says, I'll, I'll, you'll lead me down the right road, even though I don't know it. You know, so sometimes, again, you know, God, God, you know, you talk about, you know, places that you've been in your life and you wonder, like, there's times that I've been wondered, like, how to get here and why am I doing this and what does this mean? And it, it's the road you're supposed to be on, but it's not, you don't know, you don't know. You don't know if that's the right road and where you're going. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of it, you know, like, you know, I guess that, you know, it's just that, that whole trust and that, 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 that piece of trusting and that you are on the right road, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think one thing that often makes it complicated, but that maybe at least is a direction for kind of teasing out some of this is that our desires are often really, really mixed. Yeah. Like, I think most of the folks who are, you know, spending part of their Sunday morning tuning into a class like this yeah. do have a genuine desire to please God. 
but we all also have genuine desires for other things. Right, right. right. For, for comfort, for power, for being thought well of in the eyes of others, exactly. for, for whatever. And those can get really intertwined. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hard to know, well, where does my desire to please God end? Yeah. And where does my desire to be seen by other people as a you know, good Christian you know, begin? It's a great point of how our desires are often kind of muddled together and um you know that's that's um something for for self-reflection i feel like mm -hmm. for everybody who might be listening today it's a great exercise to think about what you desire you know out of life and sure we all desire to follow the will of god and um but do we what else do we desire you know like desire acceptance or approval or you know all these things that steph already said and how do we, I don't know, how do we um, see through all of those? That's, that'd be a good reflection for today. If you'd like to dive into, dive into yourself, that, that would be good. Um, you know, St. Augustine once said, For you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And I'm wondering, what does that mean? statement, you know, what is St. Augustine's prayer there have to do with this Thomas Merton prayer? Do you see any echoes in the Merton prayer of the Augustine prayer? Which again, I'll, I'll say it to you again. For you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Do you feel like this prayer is from someone who's feels a little bit restless. Mm -hmm. I kind of do. And has and, fear. And has fear. And has fear, real fear. And has real fear. Real fear. Um, I guess all fear is real. When you think about that. Mm -hmm. If you're feeling fearful, it's probably real to you. It's real, yeah. yeah. You know, even if, even if you can't understand it, yeah. You know, I know my wife fears spiders, and I can't understand that. You know, but when when there's a little creepy eight-legged thing crawling across the floor, you, the fear is real. The uh, fear is real. The feel is real. And she's jumping up so on the, the chair and screaming, and kill screaming. it, kill it, kill we know it. Ellen, <laughs> you know, Ellen, if you're out there, hello there. <laughs> we know about your fear of spiders now. Yeah. <laughs> so, Just you know, saying. so that you know, it is real, and and I think he's speaking of that real fear. Of, yeah. uh, you know, as, fear. as Saint Augustine was too. You know, yeah. and. Yeah, Anne on Facebook noted those lines in the prayer that talk about, I will trust you always yeah. and have no fear. Yeah. And she says that is sometimes easier said than done. Yes, absolutely. yes, absolutely. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and <clears throat> even I heard echoes of Psalm 23 in, mm -hmm. in yes. this prayer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, when he says, I will not fear, or I, I'm sorry, um, I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death, I will not fear, really reminds me of, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall, I will not fear. I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Right. So um, definitely hear echoes of Psalm 23 in, in this, in this prayer. And the psalmist in Psalm 23 definitely sounds like they're in a fearful kind of restless place as well. So it's just it's that same kind of honesty and trust, you know. You know, that, there's, that, there's that preposition in, that, in Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley, is that there's that, it's through the valley and not, you know, God leads us through it and not, doesn't just leave us there alone, but guides us through. So. And I think that in this prayer, also, if you go further in the psalm, it says, for thou art my God. Yeah. So that's like yeah. even what Thor, yeah. Uh, or, yeah, Merton is saying here, it's, I don't fear I fear, but I don't fear right. because I know you're my God. Yeah. And it's because you're with, you know what I mean? So that's yeah. that peace. It's again, that desire to know God, that desire to be yeah. in God's place and with God, uh, the, the, that although we have that fear, helps us walk through it. Yeah. This last sentence, this affirmation, yeah. you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Yeah. yeah. That's that, that, that trust right. that the right. psalmist talks right. about too. Yeah. yeah. And that kind of says to me, like if I, 
end up not following your will and I'm led astray by my own desires that are not in accordance with yours, that still you're going to be with me and not leave me to face those perils alone. Because even though I made some mistakes, I took the wrong road, you're still going to follow Um you know, the way that God did when, you know, of course, the Israelites didn't make the right decisions and kept turning away from God over and over and over again. God still was with them and did not leave them um, and just continued to be faithful to them. And I think that's kind of what we're hearing here is that, like, yes, God will always be faithful to us no matter if we make some wrong turns or not. And in our modern GPS world, it's kind of like God recalculating, right? Recalculating. God's recalculating yes. us, right? Recalculating. I, I mean, really, when, I, when you said that, I thought about that when I take the wrong road. You know, it's recalculating road. and turn around, go yes. back. You know, just yesterday we went the wrong way. And I, it, the, you know, the GPS immediately is saying, turn around here and make a, you'll loop back and get yeah. you back. I'm trying to get you back on the right road. And I think God sometimes helps us recalculate and yes. puts us back on the right road, even though we take that little yes. side journey, right? Exactly. And stop by the fruit stand or whatever. Right? <laughs> yeah. so. And oftentimes God can bring good out of that right. too. I mean, we have to have faith that like God can bring good out of, you know, sometimes the wrong turns that we do take. And, and that, you know, it's expected from us because we're sinful creatures. But, you know, still there is that, you know, um, desire to be obedient to the Lord. And so it's, it's what, a, what a great, what a great prayer. And I hope those of you who are listening in, keep this prayer, dig it out, pray it. Um, When you don't know what else to pray, sometimes it's so helpful um, to just dig out some of these great prayers because um, they're, you know, they're wonderful prayers that we can count on. I want to look at um, another prayer. And before we do this prayer, this is... Prayer is by Walter Brueggemann. He's just, you know, I think I've talked about him before in this forum. He's just one of my favorites. He's just one of my favorite authors. He's one of my favorite speakers. He's super snarky when he gets, like, when he really gets going on things and he's got this raspy voice and he's just, oh, he's great. He's fantastic. Let me get a Bible because we're going to read. I have it here, Allison. Um, Do you want this? Now, um, Brueggemann um, is a professor at a seminary. I, I'm blanking on which one, one in, in, in the South. And um, before he taught a class on, he's an Old Testament professor, actually. And before he taught this class on 1 Samuel 1, verses 1 to 20, he prayed this prayer. We're going to go ahead, we're going to actually read the scripture before we pray the prayer, because it might make a little bit more sense to us once we kind of know what's going on in 1 Samuel 1 because I know many of you don't know exactly (laughs) off the top of your head what happens in 1 Samuel 1. So I'm going to ask Steph, you have that? Okay, great. If you can read for us, um, okay, we're starting in chapter 1, verses 1, and we're going to go to 20. There was a certain man from Ramathame, a Zufite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeraham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. She, she did a good job on that, everybody. <laughs> she did awesome with all those things. Oh, oh very good, Steph. Awesome. You put me on the spot here, Allison. <laughs> <laughs> all right. He had two wives. One was called Hannah, and the other Pen- 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 Penina? Mm-hmm. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Hmm. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion, because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. 
This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow, saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah lay with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. Wow. Thank you, Steph. Uh, what a story. You know, what a... Just a... I don't know. Story of brokenness and grief. And yet, faithfulness, faithfulness of God. Um, we're going to read now from the second, the second prayer. And I'm going to ask, Eric, if you could read this for us. Just go, sure. just go really slow yep. with this. And um, we're going to try to put the, the words in the chat for those of you who are online. We'll try to put those in the chat. Okay. God. It does not come easy to us to imagine that you closed the womb of Mother Hannah and thereby foreclosed the future for a time. And yet, we can name in your presence a myriad of shut down places around us. Those shut down in poverty and despair. Those shut down in fear and rage those shut down by abuse and violence, too hurt to speak, too frightened to appear, too scared to dance, and closer our own shutdowns and anxiety and resentment and pretense, too weary to care, too greedy to share, too much of us for neighbor. These are not all you're doing, we confess, but you are the God who opens all shutdowns. By your power, you give futures. By your goodness, you give hope. By your mercy, you make new. So we bid you this day to come to our shutdown places and give birth anew. We pray through the Easter opening of the Friday shutdowns. Amen. That's Walter Bergerman. Oh, wow. 
So, so Brueggemann just, this is this prayer, it's almost like a poem. I mean, it's so, it's so beautiful. And in this prayer, I love this, in this prayer, he already, you know, if you can imagine, you're in seminary, you've just read this, you probably read this for homework, this was probably like a homework assignment, and now you're coming into class and you're going to be talking about this with Walter Brueggemann. And this is how he opens his class. It's fantastic how a professor like this would give permission like this to wrestle with the scripture. And he does it through this very first line where he says, God, it does not come easy to us to imagine that you closed the womb of Mother Holy. And that's what he begins with. And um, to give a, a seminary class that permission to be like, yeah, that's what I was hung up on too. Like everybody's coming into this class thinking, how in the world could God do this to Hannah? Who obviously just loved and adored Elkanah, who loved and adored her. They had this love story. And she was bullied by Penina or whatever. I, I call her Penina, I think. What did you call her? Pen, pen, I, I, we don't know. But anyway, she was bullied by this woman who. Let's call her Pen, just for sure. Pen, yeah, let's just call her bullied by Pen, who, um, you know, had, you know, all these children and she was bullied by her. She was even bullied by the priest, by even Eli, who was like, you're a drunk woman. You know, that's just like, you know, and here she is pouring out her heart and her soul in her own prayer, in her own prayer, God, remember me. You know, that's her own prayer. Um, and yet she's being bullied and, um, and things are just not going well for Hannah. Hannah just really experiences profound, profound, profound sadness and grief, and to think that God closed her womb, that is something that you should be wrestling with in scripture. And here, Walter Brueggemann gives his class permission to do that. And I just think that's extraordinary. I think that's extraordinary. And I think it's almost instructive too for us, um, and the reason why I created this prayer, and even, there's other reasons too, but one of the reasons is because oftentimes scripture confuses us. And scripture kind of leaves us sometimes more with questions than answers. And sometimes our prayers, if they're honest, they recognize that. <laughs> and, and how important is it for us to do that sometimes? You know, when we are reading scripture, you know, and the, doing the daily discipline or weekly discipline or whenever you read scripture, you're doing that discipline of scripture reading. And you're like, God, I don't get it. I don't get it. I just don't. Um, and then you're able to go to God in prayer with that, that type of emotion, those types of questions. I just, I think that's instructive for us. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm really struck by the way that this prayer really holds that intention with the idea that even though we have these deep, profound, troubling questions, and yeah. that that's okay, yeah. but that that means we don't just sort of say, oh, well, this, is, this doesn't matter. I don't know what to right. do with this. I'm going to throw it out. Right. But it's still very deeply engaged with the scripture yes. and you know, affirms that we can learn really powerful and beautiful things about God yes. really. in the midst of having midst. deep and troubling questions, and that those things coexist. Exactly. That I think sometimes we maybe want to say, like, we can either be deeply in love with and comforted by Scripture, yeah. or we can be skeptical and troubled and confused. And in this prayer, Brueggemann really gives us a model of both of those things both coexisting. Both of those things, absolutely. Ha yeah, absolutely. I love that. And I love, I love how he ends, and we can talk about that a little, in a little bit, but I love how he ends the prayer, you know, recognizing the Good Friday, that after the Good Friday comes the Easter birth, right? The Easter renewal, the Easter renewal. Right. So, um, you know, that, that is in there, and he holds those in tension, which is awesome. I also like the way he goes, and he t starts with the scripture, and then he goes and, and recognizes the shutdowns in the world, right, where there's poverty, 
and um, where people are hurting. And then he, then, he, and then he brings it even more personal and says, and we even recognize our own shutdowns. Where are we shut down in our own lives? So just love how Brueggemann in his prayer says, okay, here's our overarching scripture. Here's our struggle with the scripture. Here's how it pertains to the world. Here's how it could be focused on ourselves and how we could be, we could learn from it. And then he makes sure he brings it home at the end. I'm telling you, this prayer, when I read this, I was like, this is a sermon. It's like a mini, it's like everything you want to do in a sermon, like Brueggemann just did in like a one-page prayer. Like it is extraordinary. It is extraordinary talent. And I can't express that enough how, you know, how talented somebody is to be able to bring all these things together and really um, make it really so poetic. Is there anything specific that really stood out to you? Any any line, and you, you at home too, is there any line in here that really kind of grabbed you? Um, I think even going back to the beginning, I was sitting here thinking a little bit, you know, like for me the struggle with that, that opening piece is that, you know, when we think of God the Father, we think God the Creator, we think about creating and creation and stuff, and, yeah. and you know, the womb and the birth is, is where the creation occurs, <laughs> and like, so why would a Creator God shut down creation? Do you know what I mean? Like, that's just a struggle there. Yeah. And, 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 and Bergman even says, and thereby foreclosed the future. Foreclosed the future. Closed the future for a time. Yeah. yeah. You, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it, it, so he doesn't say it's forever. Right. But, but, but again, that's, I think, part of our, the tension I have with, like, why would, why would God close the future for a time? God the creator. Let's just let dwell on the God the creation part. Yeah. You know, God who creates all things and is looking to create good in the world. Why? You know, that, and, and maybe there's some, you know, you know, there's some people out there that maybe aren't able to conceive children. And that could be a question they have. Why, you know, why God? Why, why, why am I not allowed to create a life in this situation? Why are you not allowing me to have the blessing of a child? You know, as Hannah was. I mean, and then she's sobbing about, it. I mean, I think that that's, that's also part of it. You know, she's sobbing so much that, the, the person at the door thinks she's drunk. She's so like, and yeah. we've seen people like that that are, you know, so out of control that you kind of go yeah. like, what's up with them? Are they losing their mind, you know? Yeah. But she was so wrapped up in her grief over this oh, yeah. issue that, yeah. that the person actually thought she was yeah. drunk. So yeah, yeah. Definitely. Just, yeah. Definitely. Did anybody say anything in particular in Facebook? Anything that stood out to them? Not yet. Okay. I think this one maybe needs some more time to ponder. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but the, yeah. the text is in the Facebook chat, so you can definitely, you know, re read that over. I'm really struck after this litany of all of the shut down places in our world and in our lives. Yeah. I'm struck by this line, these are not all you're doing, we confess. Uh -huh but you are the God who opens all shutdowns. Yeah. yeah. And especially in contrast with the opening line about how we don't know what to do with this line in scripture right. of closing the womb of Hannah. Right. And so whether it's things that scripture says God does or whether things that, you know, God simply allows to happen that we know are not God's fault, but that for whatever reason God permits, right. that in a sense, those are kind of the same general yeah. <laughs> problem we have to exactly. be confounded right. by. Yeah. And yeah. we don't know what to make of either of those mysteries. Right. But we do have this promise that God is and will be opening the shutdowns. Yeah. That this, this myriad of, of confusion and grief mm -hmm. and the genuine questions that arise from that are, are for a time. Right. But they're not the end of the story. Right. And, and that we can trust God to open the shutdowns. And the reason we can trust God to open them is because we pray through the Easter opening of the Friday shutdown. We can trust God because God raised Jesus from the dead. And that's how we know that God's going to open all the shutdowns. Um, or, so, I, and I think that's really important. That last line is the, the good news. Like, that's the good news. Mm -hmm. And I love how, boy, I just love how he put that line in there. We pray through the Easter opening of the Friday shutdowns. That's just beautiful.
That's a great line. Yeah. And how powerful for today. Yeah. When yeah. so many things have been shut down. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, that we continue yeah. to pray, you know, I mean, even, even you know, worship. Worship has been shut. You know, how we pr continue to pray exactly, right. through the Easter opening that some, you know, that someday we will be open again and yeah. we will be yeah. worshiping together again. Yeah. Not virtually, but in, in person, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's the great hope in all of this, yeah. you know. And that the church would experience a rebirth, rebirth and a like reopening. A yeah, yeah. Like that's what I'm hoping for. You know, like <laughs> God, please. You know, a and, huge revival. But I yeah. do think even if you know the church doesn't explode with a revival or something like that, at least we will be more appreciative of gathering together. You know, and knowing how so easily it can be taken away from us. You know, yeah. that that that's just you know. And just think about the celebration it could be, you know, like I'm right. thinking about Easter morning with, you know, mm -hmm. loud, you know, trumpets and, you know, just all that kind of, you know, like yeah. as the Bible says that it could be this great rejoicing when we yeah. do. Mm -hmm. I think it will be this great rejoicing when we reopen. I hope that we have as much celebration in the church as we have, or probably going to have celebrations outside yeah. of the church exactly. when we reopen, yeah, right? I know, I know. <laughs> so. That's true. We've got some comments here. Good, cool. All right. All right. So Pat uh, sort of paraphrases the theme of the prayer, by your mercy, you make new. Oh, wow. Yes. Um, Amen. Sherry has a question about the Samuel text. Okay. Uh, she says, was she, I'm assuming this means Hannah, uh, was Hannah chosen by God because he knew she would honor God with her son? Mm. Maybe similar to Mary and Joseph, who were outside of the cultural norm. Yes, yes. Very, yeah, yeah. yes. Love yeah. that. Yeah. And, and we do, when we read later in this book, we find out that Samuel has a very special call from God. <laughs> I, was say, I just <laughs> preached on that two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Samuel does have a special call from God, and, and Hannah did too. Yeah. You know, yeah. To, yeah. To, bear, to bear this son, to... Um, to dedicate him to the Lord, which, you know, he did. And then he came to serve Eli, who was the one who actually accused her of being right. drunk. drunk. Right, you know? right, So, like, right. this is all connected. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, God's amazing how God works through this, this right. story. It's really, it's really amazing. Yeah. yeah. And, and Anne shares a really personal anecdote here. She yeah. says, I can appreciate Hannah's pain. When I did adopt and then give birth, they were both miracles. Uh, could give God the glory. Mm -hmm. um, so this, yeah, yeah, this this pain of not being able to Absolutely. conceive a child is certainly something that lots of folks in our congregation, maybe even listening right now, have yes. firsthand experience of. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Anne, for sharing that. Yeah. Um, um, this is a fantastic prayer that you know I I thought really um, really was was good for today, a, a more modern prayer. Um, prayer number three, we don't have much more time. We're kind of running out of time. Um, and so I'm just wondering where we want to go now. Well, while you're thinking, I'll just say that since we're talking about prayer, I was so touched reading Hannah's prayer in the scripture text. Yes. I know that's not the one we're primarily talking about, but just this this story of a woman in the Bible who is so honest about her pain to God. Thomas Merton yeah. and Walter Brueggemann that we read here today. Right. But I think H Hannah's prayer is also one that is really touching. Yeah, let's read that again, actually. So um, it starts in verse... 11. Okay, so, um, so in 10 it says, In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord, and she made a vow, saying, so this is her prayer, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. So that's, that is her prayer. That is her prayer. So she, she, makes a, she makes a promise. They say a vow. They, they use the word vow in here. I don't know if you 
have an NIV? Um, it says there. vow here, too. Okay, it's it says vow, too. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, she, she makes a vow, a covenant, a promise, right, with the Lord, to the Lord, um, that sh if the Lord allows her to bear a son, she's going to dedicate that son to the Lord. So um, what, what about this prayer? really kind of resonates with those of you who are out there. Um, I, for me, what I hear in this prayer is real desperation. Um, and I, you know, you, you always have a different way about them when when they're prayed in desperate in times of desperation, like you're just you're just praying different kinds of prayers when you're when you're desperate, um, and when there's a real urgency, you know what I mean? There is a and I, you know, I think I've been in those times. Whether you know, if I can remember, just you know, my my like my brother and his wife got really bad news about their. Um, their, their, their baby, um, my, 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 um, my sister-in-law was pregnant at the time, and, you know, they got one of those ultrasounds or whatever, and something showed up on there, and um, it was really scary. You know, it was, it, was, it was so scary for them, and I would just remember just being in prayer for, like, hours, this desperate kind of praying, you know, it, it was so desperate. It was so urgent. And it was lots of tears. And I just kind of, like, that's kind of what I think of when I listen to this prayer from Hannah. Yeah. I mean, have, have you guys prayed in desperate times? And how have those prayers been different from just the regular prayers that you play, pray, you know, during just like a regular day? Yeah. I mean, I guess in my experience, sometimes in times that feel really desperate, prayer comes much more naturally, yeah. and yeah. other times it is much more of a struggle. Yeah. And it's hard to predict yeah. which it's going to be, yeah. but it seems like those sort of times of desperation can really lead both ways to make feeling really closed off from prayer yeah. or feeling just such a natural like, pull towards it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I love how Hannah describes her experience in prayer yeah. in verse 16 when she's accused of like being drunk. And she says, yeah. no, no, I was pouring out my soul to the Lord mm -hmm. in verse 15. Yep. Yep. And then in verse 16, she says, I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Yeah. Yeah. So for Hannah, that anguish and grief clearly led her to prayer. And I think in the prayer, the line just saying, you know, you know, it's, oh, Lord Almighty. Like, you know, yeah. I think that, you know, the days that I'm praying, I might be saying, hey, God, it's me, you know, but like, <laughs> yeah. oh, Lord, Lord Almighty. Almighty. It's like, you know, it's like, it's yeah. like, my God, my God. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, it's like, you know, oh, Lord Almighty, you know, yeah. and then it's said, you know, if you would only look upon your servant's misery and remember me. Yeah. Like, I mean, that, that is so... Like my heart just sinks. Yeah. Look upon your serve. Yeah. I'm sir. I'm trying to serve. You know, we talked about the the first prayer. You know, in serving, and I'm trying to do your desire. But here I am in misery, even though I'm doing your desire. Yeah. Can you just look at me? Can you come? Yeah. Just like just I'm just looking for this much. You know, like I there's just that I don't know. Like to me, like it's just that, you know, that yeah. anguish. Like you said, the yeah. anguish of grief and and fear and all that that's in here that. Uh, she's just, you know, in some ways, I think looking for a little bit of relief mm -hmm. from everything that comes before that, all the all the things that are happening to her in her life, and how the, and and that if this thing would be given to her, mm -hmm. she's going to give it all back to the Lord. And I think that there's a message. Yeah. If this thing that I so desperately want is given to me, and I think that sometimes people do pray for that kind of stuff. Like mm -hmm. I'm so desperate for this thing, I want it. God, if you give this to me, I'll do this mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think God works that way sometimes, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but her prayer is so genuine that she is granted that. Mm -hmm. Do you know yeah. what I mean? 
Yeah, she's not saying if you do this you thing do for me, me then and only then right. will I become your servant. <laughs> right. She identifies yeah. herself so as God's servant, servant right. even yeah. in her state of lack. Yeah, that's right. And I think that seems like a crucial difference. Yeah. 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 I guess that's what I was trying to say, that there is a difference in here, that sometimes people pray for things, yeah. but it's, she's praying because she is a servant. Yeah. And God sees that, and that's why it's granted. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. And God honors that. God honors that. And, and, and it's, it's really meaningful to, to hear, to, to see in this passage that God, God enters into our, our grief. You know, and just, and I mean, I'm, I'm so certain that God just felt the pain, you know, of, of Hannah in that moment, you know, mm -hmm. because, it, and it says like later on, you know, at the, towards the end of what we read, it says, you know, God remembered, the Lord remembered her, you know, the Lord didn't, did not forget that pain, but like held that pain in and remembered Hannah. And um, so just another way I think we can see how God enters into our suffering and God enters into our suffering through Jesus Christ but here in the Old Testament we see that even God God was doing it even then entering into the suffering of his people and willing to hear the cries and this and the grief um, yeah that's just meaningful it's very meaningful because I know that there may be people out there right now that are you know, tuning in and, um, you know, they're maybe for one reason or another just not able to conceive. And that's just a really hard thing. It's just a really hard thing. And I think the acknowledgement there, the, the, the affirmation that I want to give is just that God hears, hears your pain and, and understands your suffering. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I think that's what we get from this passage is that God, God is faithful to us. No matter if um, we end up on the road that we thought we would or we end up on a different road, God's always going to be faithful to us. And I think that's probably a good place to end for today. So I hope both of these prayers, uh, these three prayers, actually, including the one from Hannah, really uh, inspired you this morning. I hope you keep them um, close and, and pray them often because they are wonderful, honest prayers of trust and, um, and faith. So. Why don't we end with a word of prayer? Let's pray. Gracious God, I want to pray for everybody who joined us this morning, for everybody who is listening in on this conversation today, for everyone, Lord, who prays prayers of joy, prayers of, of sadness, prayers of grief. Um, Lord, we know that we come to you in all of the seasons of our lives, and you hear us. You enter into our pain. You enter into our joy. You are amazing, and we thank you for being our God, for walking with us on this journey of life. And we pray, Lord, that we continue to the desire uh, to do your will, and that even though when we <laughs> lose our way, that you will protect us from the perils um, of our lives. And so we thank you, God, for being ever faithful to us and for the grace that we receive every day. I thank you for this day, for this Sunday morning, this snowy Sunday morning. I pray, Lord, that you bring us back together next Sunday to dive back into your word, into the prayers of your people, so that we can learn more about you and rejoice in the great God that we have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks for joining us, everybody. See you next Sunday. Thank you. Thanks. Nice, robust conversation. Yeah, it was a great conversation. Appreciate the conversation and the...